Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's podcast. We have on uh, a special guest and a good friend we've had before, Mr. Scott Thomas. Scott is a, uh, a Christian, a family man, and he is a uh, Christian financial um, uh, wealth manager, you could say, for other terms. He'll, he'll, he'll discuss that in a minute. And he's been doing it for uh, several decades. And he's got important advice to talk about in regards to the reset, as well as post-RV preparations and, um, and organic food growth as well, which is a kind of an exciting topic we don't always get to cover. If you are new to the channel, please do like and subscribe and share as it does help the channel grow and for you to learn, for others to learn from the advice and the knowledge that you are gaining. Scott, thank you for joining us again and welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me, John. It's great to be back. Yes, likewise, an honor. So let's set the table where you normally would expect it, a couple of key questions. So we talked about this last time on our show a few months back, but I want to delve into it a little bit more granularly now in the aspect that, um, you know, you have clients that you've talked about. I think you said, uh, if I remember right, roughly you recommend five to 10% of their um, expenditures or their, their money put in to go to precious metals. Mm -hmm. But what I want to talk about today, taking a step further is I think our audience needs to hear that there are financial wealth managers or stewards, what, whatever the term you want to use. And I'll let you do that in a minute that you also, in certain instances, do recommend the foreign currencies, the bonds, certain cryptos, et cetera, to accompany the metals because everything is kind of encompassed in the other. So can you talk about the clients that you have shared that with and how you go about doing that? Yes. Yeah, so I have a curious mind. Um, I can tell you, I had a couple of guys who came in here who were mining Bitcoin. And um, I said, so tell me about that. Tell me how it works. Um, how do you, how confident do you feel in it? And they were totally confident. They were just like, Scott, this, this thing is what, what it, it fits with me. I said, then run with it. But when there's a huge run up, consider taking some off the table and diversifying. That's, that's a prudent thing to do, whether it's a crypto, whether it's, you know, stocks or metals or anything, you may want to diversify. So um, that's usually the part of the strategy. That's part of the risk management as an advisor would be when something does run up, you want to take some off the table. I sold a cryptocurrency personally this past week. Uh, I had a funny story to tell about that. Um, and so I had a little bit of money, not much, and I put it into a different crypto. And it was one that had a different kind of a uh, bent to it than the one that ran up. So yeah, you want to diversify when you want to hold on to monies. You don't want everything sitting in one one item. It's it's not prudent. However, if you listen to some of the experts on Wall Street that talk about growing wealth, they talk about having a, a singular business, um, a singular hobby that makes money, a singular a uh, metal, a singular stock, a singular whatever for heavy growth. But then after you get to a point, you want to pull some money off the table. It's always prudent to diversify. Make sense? So Ooh. that's kind of the direction where I go with this. Um, openly, I am more, way more pro uh, currency or other things after I'm seeing what's going on in banking right now. Uh, over the last couple of years, um, especially in the last year, for what I've seen in banking, I have very little trust in our banking system, and I have very little trust with the new bail-in versus mm -hmm. the bail-out. Did we talk about that last time? No, but feel free. Go ahead. So um, people know what a bailout is. Uh, bailout was when 2008 hit and all these banks were being, insurance companies and, and banks were being bailed out. That means the taxpayers were dumping money into those banks. After that 2010-11 legislation was put in place in order to do, we're never going to do a bailout again. It's called a bail-in. And what a bail-in says, you can look this up on Investopedia, has a really good definition, and but I'll paraphrase it, is that um, the monies that are uninsured, it doesn't necessarily mean above 250000 because FDIC may fail miserably at $1. And if that happens, then all monies that are uninsured could overnight at the discretion of the bank that quickly be turned into that bank stock. 
So you are, in fact, putting your money, you think it's on deposit, but it may not actually be there if it's uninsured. It could flip and actually be converted into the bank stock, which might be worthless. And in the Great Depression, there were 9,000 plus banks that failed in the 1930s. Um, in fact, uh, Jerome Powell says we're going to have failures. I just saw an article this week saying expect 500 bank failures in 2024. Yep. Now, it's mostly going to be small, medium-sized organizations. But guess what? We only had, what, 157 during the credit crisis. We're talking about 2000. You can go to the, the Federal Reserve. You can see these numbers. From 2008 through to, into 2009, those two years, it was 157 banks. Well, I think we're going to see a lot more than that happen based upon Basel III, based upon uh, interest rate hikes, based upon a lot of things. And yesterday, um, we saw that the temporary bank funding mechanism is no longer available. Yep. Well, that means in the next 60 days, we're going to see we're going to see something hit the news. And you've seen us report all what you're talking about on the Telegram channel because I know you're on there. So you see we substantiate that as well, to your point. That's great. And um, before we, uh, there's two questions inside that Scott, I want to ask you is yeah. uh, touch on Basel III because we touch on that with, with our audience, but I think it's good for, for people to hear from somebody like you who's you know been in this a lot longer, why Basel III is so important. Before you do that, though, let's go back to the currencies and bonds and what you're telling certain clients to invest in in regards to that when the subject comes up. Well, I think letting people know first that banking is not as safe as you think it is. And if you if you predicate things based on that, there are a lot of people who have always thought banking, 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 I'm safe, CD, money market, those. And, and so if it's not safe, where do I put my money? And I tell people precious metals is always a great place to be. Precious metals in hand. We're not talking about an ETF, okay? Um, that can be a disaster. The whole ETF thing. I do not trust it. My heart tells me don't trust the ETF. Um, by the way, um, when I back to the cryptocurrency thing, I want to mention something because I was real curious when these two guys came in two different occasions and they were mining Bitcoin and they were doing well with it. Um, is I got interested and I started studying and looking and learning and you know trying to process some things. And so I came across an ETF, and I won't say which one it was, but it's the big ETF that buys basically 58 blockchain technologies. Mm -hmm. And I put a little bit of money in it. It wasn't a lot, you know, and I have been sorely disappointed in that um, because it is not really designed to build wealth. It's not designed to be a mechanism. It's kind of a cheap i would call it um a cheap way to quote feel like you're putting your toe in the water into the blockchain area but it 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 has not proven itself it has been a disaster really and uh, all i've seen it do is decline 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 and more and more expenses every year mm -hmm. so. so what thank you why would you what would you say is the importance that you stress to your clients of understanding basil three yeah, so Basel III, a couple of things have happened with that. So that's the Swiss system mm -hmm. of the banking system that has requirements. It'll say you have to have this, this much money on reserves. You have to have these kinds of assets. Um, they have added gold back into the Basel system to count as an asset. That was taken out for a while and it's been added back. And that's important because that means that the central banks and the global governments, they're viewing gold as being a real commodity, as, as something that is a real asset. So um, I'm not like real uh, engaged into Basel III. I just know that all of my banking friends and people I know in the banking world they're scared about what Basel III can do to them because it can literally put them out of business like that. Just like FDR signed things away that basically crashed those 9,000 banks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. And so, and I think people need to understand, we've touched on in our show 
you know, on my wrap up shows, but also with guests like yourself that, uh, while today the fiat currency, not talking about the U S dollar, I'm talking about foreign currencies are not yet backed and same with the cryptos are not yet backed by precious metals does not mean they will not be. That's the whole point of BRICS. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you saw yesterday, the South African wing of BRICS has now invited 34 more countries to join mm -hmm. on top of the 40 that are already waiting in the wings, like Zimbabwe, Nigeria's express interest. So with that in mind, when you do, I don't mean to harp on it, but again, I just want the audience to hear from you. When you do get to the subject of foreign currencies and they ask you which ones to get, what do you typically recommend? Well, I rarely get asked that question, number one. That, that's not a common question that I would ever say that I've asked. In fact, I was talking to some friends at a conference recently, financial advisors, and I said, you guys ever get asked about foreign currencies? And it was like out of 20 people, it was like one, one advisor. Yeah, mm -hmm. I get asked about it once in a while. It's just out there on the edge. Most people would not even ask their advisor. I think that you need to ask your advisor. You need to ask the people that you're surrounded by, ask them about it. But you want them to ask you good questions about what do they know about you? What do they know about your risk tolerance? What do they what do they know about you and the things you want to accomplish? Because it's really important, whatever you buy, that it fits with the time horizon, it fits with the risk level, it fits with understanding. They can help you understand aspects of it. For example, um, in the crypto space, this is an important one that I learned the hard way. I learned the wrong way is you want to use a limit order. What's a limit order? That means you limit the price. And so, uh, in fact, I went to go put in the order this morning for a crypto, this small amount, and it said this can vary by 40%. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, 40%? That's scary. And so I quickly backed out of it, hit previous screen, clicked on from market order to limit order, pushed the limit order, put the number in, and I put my number just this much higher than what the market was, and it still executed below that limit. Hmm. That's a beautiful thing. So remember the limit orders, that will save you and it will um, you'll feel much smarter and more in control when you use the limit order. Hmm. Good tip. Thanks, Scott. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, you had brought up an interesting point when we we talked offline uh, with respect to sort of the uh, lottery ticket syndrome that I think we, we deal with that a lot. I mean, it, there's a lot of people who uh, are looking for this to bring them a lot of wealth and, and it will, but the more important and overarching point is we've always talked about that from a faith perspective is you know, how do you grow it? How do you secure it? And how do you build legacy upon it? So can you touch on that and, and the whole lottery ticket syndrome, how you've helped people's mindset with that subject? Yeah. So this was a, a important topic for me back in the early 1990s, because I was dealing with structured settlements. Uh, so somebody would be in a personal injury case, workers comp, but they'd get a big settlement, you know, $3 million. And, you know, a long time ago, that was a lot of money. And so how would they deal with that? And so the Stanford studies have been going on for decades. And what they show is that windfalls, it can be uh, inheritance, lottery, crypto, it can be a lot of different things. You have a big windfall. There's a 90% of those who get that windfall will be broke in five years or less. Five years or less, 90% of that is all gone. And so with that being said, who are the people who are successful? How do they overcome that? Why are they not successful? I have personal stories where I've seen um, people blow up and crash and burn. And the worst one is when I had an 18-year-old who inherited $800,000 when he was 18 back in 1987. And he blew through that 800,000 in seven years and he died broke at 25. And it was hard living and just bad decisions and he couldn't handle it. His sister, on the other hand, one year older, both were clients, um, she did fabulous. Put it into real estate, started a couple of businesses, did prudent things in a completely different path. And so um, 
this whole um, wealth syndrome, the sudden wealth syndrome is people are in shock. And what happens is they get insomnia, they get depression, they get um, all kinds of things that literally will attack them. And it's a abnormal behavior. And this behavioral psychologist say, the best way to overcome this, these symptoms and this issue is get a financial advisor and get some therapy, get into some kind of a therapy. So it'd be uh, mental health counseling, psychologist, um, professional coaching, personal coaching, things you need, some, you need, you need feedback, you need perspective. And so a financial advisor shouldn't be just saying, oh, here's a bunch of stocks and bonds. Here's a bunch of allocations you ought to do. These are the things that Wall Street says. No, they ought to be looking out for you and asking you questions about what are the things you want to accomplish with your family, with your community, the way you're wired. Because guess what? Well, here's the, oh, there's the thumbprint. Yeah, <laughs> nobody else has a thumbprint like you. And that's always a reminder to me that um, we're uniquely made. You're not a number. Wall Street would say, and the commercials would say, you're a number, get to your number. Oh, you got to get to your number. No, mm -hmm. I've seen people get to the number and die six months later. I've seen people get to their number and they play golf all day and then they're bored and they literally die or pass away or get sick. I've seen other people who have brought in significant wealth. They've had windfalls, but they had purpose. They surrounded themselves with good people and they had the humility to say, I don't know everything. I don't know all the answers to all the questions. I'm going to get good counsel. You know, with good counsel, plan succeed is what Solomon says. Mm -hmm. You know, he also says, divide your money by seven or eight. That's not seven or eight stocks or mutual funds. <laughs> it, it, you've got to do some things to um, diversify when you do have wealth that's built. And so having a process also for accountability and uh, transparency going forward. So when you have something that happens, you can't just like forget about it. You're kind of operating your own personal business. So let's say that the, the dinar um, revalues and all of a sudden now you're worth $10 million. So you're worth $10 million. Do you know what you're going to do? How are you going to deal with the taxes, the tax filings? How do you know, how are you going to deal with, with the people who come to you like the lottery winners saying, oh, I heard you made some money. And now they want to lean on you. They want to guilt you. Or now you're at a place where you're going, I'm eating at nicer restaurants, but now I can't take my friends because I'll have to pay for them because they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of dynamics that go on here. So having a mental health counselor, having a financial advisor, having trusted friends that will tell you truths and not judge you and not you know, work you over, but really speak into your life the positive things because there's so many positive things can be done because money is a tool, it's a test, it's a testimony. And how you're working with that, you need to be thinking, okay, I need to be shrewd. I need to use this as a tool. How do I want to align my values, my mission, um, the things that are important to me? And don't forget your friends. And you're going to need some coaching to figure out how to keep those friends and build more friends. And there may be some friends you might have to let go of too. Yeah. And all really important salient points and topics that you bring up, Scott. So thank you for kind of covering that in a wide net. Um, you touched on a key point, Scott, and inside of all of that, which we talk about fairly routinely and with certain guests like yourself on the show uh, with respect to you know, the question I get a lot is, you know, well, you know, when this reinstatement happens, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, what do I do with the money or or should I convert those fiat dollars? And and again, as I always say, I'm not a financial advisor, not constituted as financial advice, just giving my experience and, and, and information that I've garnered from very smart people. Uh, you know, I always recommend to convert those those fiat dollars into tangible physical things you can touch, like you said, gold and silver. Mm -hmm. uh, weapons, if you like, land. Land. And so th this this beautifully segues into another subject I want to talk to you about that you're very good at and very passionate about. And you're probably the only 
uh, wealth manager slash advisor I've ever met to delve into this, but it is an important component that I talk to, excuse me, I talk to my audience about something I recommend they humbly do, which is buy, you know, land, you know, grow your own food, have a water source, become self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And so uh, setting the, the obvious uh, softball stage for you in one of your skill sets is you have developed a way to live off the land and grow your own food and do that. So I would love for you to share your experience and musings with the audience with regards to that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I um, I get very passionate about this stuff. Um, and people say, where does that passion come from, Scott? Like I said, well, you know, when I was about one or two years old, my dad had me out doing the compost pile. So I was always doing the compost pile. He loved pretty flowers, but um, I discovered a little over a year ago, I literally woke up in the middle of the night and I felt like there was a whisper in my ear that said, sprouting, Scott, do sprouting. And it was almost audible. And I'm going, okay, I'm going to do sprouting. Um, how do I do it? And I, started, I went online and so forth. So I've got a mason jar here. And so I've got some seeds here. And so these are, um, you have to get with the, so these seeds, about half of these seeds would go in the bottom of this jar. You fill the jar up some, um, you want the jar to be clean first. You let it sit overnight. You let that sit overnight. And then what you're going to do is the next morning is you're going to put this cheesecloth lid. You're going to drain it completely and let it sit like this on the counter, let it go all day. And then the next day, you're going to rinse it again and do the same thing. In about two to three days, it looks pretty good. It's got little sprouts, little things going. And uh, six days later, it looks something like this. So this is a quart of, this is actually fenugreek. It smells wonderful. I feel like I'm in an Indian restaurant. <laughs> I had this on my, um, my tuna wrap today, along with broccoli sprouts. By the way, broccoli sprouts are 30 to 40 times more nutritious than fresh broccoli in your backyard per density. So that's great health. So what does it cost to sprout? Um, the cheapest sprout and the most popular sprout in the world is actually the mung bean. So if you went to a grocery store and you wanted to get a two, two pints, a quart of uh, mung beans, it costs you typically about $8. Well, it costs 14 cents and one week's time to grow your own that are going to taste way better than the stuff at the at the grocery store. And you know that it's safe and it's clean and it's there. And you know that it's not old. Cost you 14 cents. That's a wonderful, that's a 3,000% return in one week. Do the math on that. I love seeds. You know, if you think about uh, God's economy, one seed has like limitless potential. It's a beautiful thing. And so I'd love to, to talk about how I've incorporated this with my children, how um, sprouting is the gateway vegetable to other gardening. I've got raised bed gardens. Um, I had scallions on my tuna fish today with the sprouts, and I'm growing those out back here at the office and at my house. Uh, I've got cauliflower and tomatoes and peppers and... Um, even Seminole pumpkins, which is native for Central Florida, uh, Seminole Indians and the, the pumpkins. I've got a whole bunch of those growing. And, and I love sharing this stuff with other people and sharing the ideas. Um, if we can grow our own food, there's something magical here. Uh, as I watch this develop from seed to life with just water, there's no chemicals, there's no fertilizers, there's no bugs, there's no pesticides. And you get to see that on your countertop. It's a reminder to me about abundance and life and growth. And it actually encourages me mentally, physically, spiritually, all the way around. And I enjoy them. I enjoy them on my salads. I enjoy them in soups and um, on sandwiches, burgers. Um, really enjoy that, but I also have gotten much more passionate and interested and in leaning into growing other food and figuring out how to propagate things and how can I share with others. So it, it's opened up um, a different pathway for me to talk about abundance and life and returns and, you know, what are you doing? And um, I also work with a food bank and they've been wonderful about providing me jars. So I'm giving a couple of talks in the next month. And so they provide the jars and um, 
that's been wonderful. Then I can just buy a few seeds and go out and share with other people and get them started. Excellent. Excellent. One of the questions I want to ask you, Scott, and thank you for all that, that uh, knowledge sharing. Um, how do you identify uh, the purity of the seeds that they're not GMO? How do you look for that? Yeah, there's several uh, online sites and online companies. Uh, funny thing is, is I had a friend who has seed company and not a seed company, but he has a, a gardening company. And so I went to see him first and I went down there and he said, oh, try some of these and try some of these. And he gave me some white navy beans and different things. And I mean, they were turning pink and they smelled horrible. I was like, what am I doing? I'm not putting that in my mouth. And I sure enough, I went online and it was like, no, you need certified organic and you need to go to reputable companies and there are at least a dozen reputable companies that i've seen that have been around a few years um, i'm not going to mention the names of them but um if somebody wanted to reach out to me i would talk with them about you know what I, i've used two or three different ones and had wonderful experience with them i do want to tell you though don't be surprised if you do black oil sunflower or I'm currently doing the black sesame seeds. They take a lot longer and they look strange and there's some uh, visual things that don't look right with them, but you kind of have to work through it. So don't be too freaked out when you look at something and it looks like moss or something growing on it or it starts to look really strange. The most important thing is a smell test when you're dealing with sprouts. Cool. That's good. Good advice. Thank you, Scott. Um, and and see, uh, speaking of that segue, which you've helped so nicely, uh, as always with our guests, we always give you last thoughts you want to say to our audience and where can people find out about your work if people want to work with you on the financial and the the uh, food uh, replication or, or, or food growth process. Yeah, yeah. So I have a website, it's stewardshipmatters.net, that's S-T-E-W-A-R-D-S-H-I-P-M-A-T-T-E-R-S.net. I have a podcast, I have, it's short format, five to 11 minutes. I have um, original videos, I've got interviews. Um, um, I've been doing this more than three decades. And so I have, um, most of my conversations are about strategy and conceptual, bigger picture, um, hey, you want smart giving strategies? Here's, you know, three of the most popular ways to do non-cash giving, you know, those types of things. So uh, somebody wants to reach out to me, they can go to the website, they can learn more about me there, they can see some more things about uh, all, the, all the different things that I'm involved with. And I really feel like um, we as um, individuals need to take on more responsibility about our own food sources and what we're eating, what we're putting into our bodies. And we're being lied to a lot on the labels and we don't wanna focus on the negative, but let's focus on the positive types of things of how, how I feel better, how I enjoy this and, and what it does to me in multiple ways, not just feeding me, but um, it's feeding me in a lot of other ways that I never expected when I picked that, pick this up, you know? Yeah, absolutely. With the uh, stewardship matters, does that also have a portal to uh, financial consulting as well? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So there will be some people that just want to say, Hey, Scott, I want to, uh, I want to buy an hour of your time. I want to, uh, or I, I want to just talk with you for a few minutes and see whether it's a good fit. And then how would a plan work for me? So we can do a quick Zoom call. I could do kind of a what if on a financial planning software. What would that look like? How would that look? And then you may say, hey, I want to hire you. Let's do a plan. My my brother does my my finances and my investments. You know, my sister does my insurance. You know, I get people who have others already in their lives, but they would like to have someone speak into their life that has experience that could maybe walk and talk them through some of the challenges that is experienced, uh, you know, in the strategies and tax savings and uh, ways in which you may can, can pour that also into your family and your charities. Yeah, that's great. Makes a lot of sense. And uh, folks also to compliment what Scott's doing is we've talked to him about possibly becoming uh, an adjunct professor in our channel, which is another reason we brought him on, so you could kind of learn his expertise. Uh, we have a channel, uh, we've talked about the Real World Academy, we've created it as a 
foreshadowing over the overarching channel, which is the patriotclub.com. It's a, think of it as a left brain, right brain. It's uh, the left brain side is a free community where you patriots can get to meet each other, chat, exchange ideas, network, um, just opening up possibilities, much like a discord channel. And then the right side of that brain, if you will, is the real world academy, which is baked inside the Patriot Club. That's a side that if you wanted to have consultations with Scott, if you wanted to meet other business owners, you wanted to uh, learn how to build streams of income in addition to uh, what you have going now, whatever your situation is, that is baked inside of that. So uh, that's an all encompassing part. And that's patriotclub.com. We'll leave that link in the description. Scott Thomas, brother, thank you for joining us uh, once again, the podcast. We look forward to having you back in the future. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Scott.